there. Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible, because it's the divinely inspired Word of God, and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate, and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. Welcome, welcome to the virtual Bible study. How's everybody doing on this morning? It is my desire. This is Lakeisha McKnight, by the way, and and hopefully you all can hear me clearly. I'm going to check my audio just to make sure we're good in these various platforms. Right now, we should be live on Facebook. Uh, We should be live on Spreaker and iHeartRadio and other podcast platforms out there. So I'm grateful. I'm honored. Uh, to be here with all of you on today. It is an an amazing Monday, August the 17th of 2020. And so again, guys, thank you so much. This is the virtual Bible study. Let's go ahead and check uh, some of the other platforms out to make sure that we are okay. I know we're also live on some of the audio podcast platforms. And I always like to make sure that for our podcast listeners, that there is no problem with them being able to tune in. It looks like it is okay. Let's go ahead and check that out really quick. It looks like it's fine. It says, of course, that we're live. Okay, so all is well. Thank you so much. Now, there are a couple of things that we're going to go over. As you can see, we've we've added a little special touch to things, right? A little different. Okay, little different, little different. So here is what we're going to do. Okay. And um, you can check in. Let us know that you're here by simply doing a couple of things. There are different ways to truly, truly be involved as we're here together. And so let us do this. Okay. Now, hopefully you should see, of course, the next slide pop up there uh, on your screen. Uh, But these are the various ways to participate in this virtual Bible study. And keep in mind, everyone, we do this virtual Bible study for the most part, Monday through Saturdays at 830 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, so that's 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to set, you know, your alarm or notification, put it on your planners so you can join us because the purpose is to help you to, to really be aligned with the will of God. That's the essential purpose of the virtual Bible study. If you want to live your life or if you have questions about what it means to have a relationship with God, or if you're looking for just, you know, something to fill an area, like you feel like you're unfulfilled, you feel like there's something missing, you might find that something by plugging into this virtual Bible study. Okay, you might just find what you're looking for by plugging in. And so again, this is why we're here, helping you to win from the inside out. Okay, winning from the inside out. We can do a whole lot of focusing in on our externals and trying to, you know, pull this up, squeeze this in. But we got to focus on that part of us that lives on eternally, that will live on forever. And that is our spirit man. Okay, our spirit man. And so that's why we're here with this VBS, virtual Bible study. Now, here are the ways to participate. Number one, you can participate by way of Zoom. Right now, we're live on the Zoom platform. So if you see the link right there, it says www.accessvbsnow.com, right? Accessvbsnow.com. So you can click there, but you need the password. 
So you would want to inbox a guest, someone that's like tuning in actively and they do it normally, or you can inbox me. Okay. Because I can see when you send me a message and I can give you the password. All right. You will be able to know what the password is and you'll be well on your way. Okay. Also, you see that you can listen in by way of Facebook because we have a stream now on Facebook. It's letting us do it. There's no problems. Thank God that that connection is working well right now. Got a little favor with that, right? And uh, look, there might be somebody doing a watch party in conjunction to this because they're active participants of the virtual Bible study. So they're actively doing watch parties as we do these streams. So definitely in the, a part of the watch party or stream, you want to like or love the stream. Okay, hit the like button, hit the love button for the stream. Also, you can comment in the comment section. You can ask questions down there as well. And then you can do your own parties. You can share this out with those that you care about, those that you love. Listen, Facebook would allow, you know, notification to go out to those who are connected to you that you're watching something very important. Okay. Because one of the things that I understand is the importance of getting this good news, the message about the kingdom of God getting this out there to the masses, because the truth is we can share a whole lot of the gospel of all types of things. Okay. Or a message about different things, watch parties about different things. But when it comes to the good news of the kingdom, we can do more. We can do more. You can also tune in now, of course, and listen by way of podcast as we're on iHeartRadio, Spreaker and other platforms. All right. So these are the various ways to participate, everyone, and hopefully uh, you can take note and you can participate as you feel led to. All right. Awesome. Now, what do you expect? What what is it that you have to expect uh, from this Bible study on this morning? Well, we're going to definitely review an overview. Okay. We're going to go over what you're going to need to know, you know, what this involves. We also have prayer. That, the, that immediately follows that because we want to make sure that our minds, our hearts are in alignment with the will of God, okay? Also, after prayer, we're going to dig into some scripture in the New Testament. So we're following along in the New Testament and you're more than welcome to follow along with us, okay? Follow along with us, okay? Have your physical Bible open or just, you know, view the screen. We're going to try to put the the, the, the verse is there up on the screen. That way you can check it out as we move along. Also, after that, we will dive into some more concepts pertaining to the kingdom. I've realized, you know, that God has given me a passion to help others, not only for myself to learn, but to help others learn even more about the kingdom of God, because that is the focus. That is the focus. You know, that was his message. That was Jesus's message during his earthly ministry. And I am persuaded in believing that that should be a message that we should be continuing, okay? Because everything flows from the kingdom down, okay? From the kingdom down. So we're going to talk, when we're going to delve more into kingdom concepts, we're going to summarize our time together, and then we're going to pray and be dismissed uh, from the session, the virtual Bible study. How does that sound? Hopefully that sounds pretty good. It looks like I do have uh, my sister here, Miss Pat, on the platform, so that's always good to know. All right. So good morning, Miss Pat. Good morning, uh, Brother Nelson. I do see Brother Nelson listening in and tuning in. An amazing, an amazing thing. I'm going to share this out, of course, to yet one more group, guys. And if you haven't shared this out, I encourage you to do so. Okay. So I'm going to share this out to one more group. All right. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So you know what happens next, right? Let us pray. It's time for prayer. We're about to pray so we can plug in, we can get started uh, with reading and studying the New Testament. Okay. So let us pray. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so very much for this day. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you for just allowing us to wake up to see this day. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercies, your loving kindness. God, we thank you because you are Lord and beside you, there is no one else. We glorify you because you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You are the great I am, that bright and morning star, that lily in the valley, 
Father, we just we just take a moment to say thank you. Thank you for the use of our senses. Thank you for the use of our limbs. And thank you so much for protecting us. Even as we slept and slumber, thank you for keeping us and our entire family. And so even now, Father, we're asking that you would forgive us. Father, forgive us of all sin. All sin. Cleanse our hearts, our minds, our every part of our being. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, God. Guide us and direct us into all truth. Help us to hear your voice and to be obedient to what you guide and direct us to do. We just pray that you would open up our hearts so that the word can be planted upon it. We pray that those who have an ear to hear, that they would listen, that they would hear your voice. And so, Father, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we ask all of these things. Amen and amen. Once again, welcome aboard, guys. Excited, excited, excited to be here. It's, it's a truly an honor and a privilege. And uh, we're doing some things a bit different, as you can see. We're getting some more visuals in play, right? We're getting some more visuals in play. All right. So, you know, the first step that we're going to engage in is really diving into our New Testament, right? The New Testament scripture, and we're still focusing in on 1 Corinthians. Remember, this is the letter that was... Um, written by Paul to the church in Corinth. Okay, the church in Corinth uh, is the focus. And so right now we're about to dive into uh, looking at the scripture there. All right, so hopefully you'll be able to follow along with me. Hopefully all is well. Let's check this out and see what happens. All right, so it looks like we may have it up already. Here we go. Let's click on that one. Okay. And so hopefully you all should see my screen there. Let me make sure uh, you can very well see it. We're going to be uh, reading and studying the entire chapter of chapter eight. Okay, so we're going to look at the entire chapter of chapter eight here, uh, and we should be good. Okay, we're going to start at verse one. Now, keep in mind, everyone, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Okay, I am reading from the New King James Version. And so you're more than welcome to read along. Okay, to read along with me. So let's clear up a couple things so that it's filling up the screen here. All right, perfect, perfect. All right, so let's read. Let's start at verse number one. It says, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven on, or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge, for some with consciousness of the idol, until now, eat it as a thing uh, offered to an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food does not commend us to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat, if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, we, will not the conscience of him who is weak be in, emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, 
I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. <laughs> we just finished reading the entirety of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And so what we're going to do right now, okay, we're going to break it down. We're going to definitely seek to gain some understanding. And listen, as we're going through this, no matter what platform you're on, uh, we, do, we do most of our engagement uh, on the Facebook platform. So right there on Facebook, if you want to definitely type in your thoughts there, that way it helps others to be able to engage, please go ahead and do so. But when you're on the ver- when you're on the Zoom platform, you'll have an opportunity to be able to share a thought or two verbally. And so that's why we enjoy that, that particular feature of getting on Zoom. So let's talk about it. Now, here's what I do want to share with you. Because at this particular point, starting at this point in this letter uh, to the Corinthians, Paul is beginning to address uh, liberty in the church, freedom in the church. Okay. Looking at verse number one, he says, now concerning things offered to idols. Now understand something. You got to understand who he's speaking to because the Greeks and the Romans were polytheistic. Okay. The Greeks and the Romans were polytheistic, meaning that they worshiped multiple gods, multiple gods. Okay. That's what that, that's what I was actually saying. And they're also polydemonistic, believing in many evil spirits. They believed in many evil spirits. They believed that evil spirits would try to invade human beings, you know, by attaching themselves to food because it was eaten and that the spirits could be removed only by the foods being sacrificed to a God. You know, the sacrifice was meant not only to, to gain favor with the God, but also to cleanse the meat from demonic contempt, contempt, well, I should say contamination. Okay. And then of course, such, you know, decontaminated meat was offered to the gods as a sacrifice, right? And so we got to be careful after conversion, believers resented They resented eating such foods bought out of idol markets because it reminded um, sensitive Gentile believers of their previous pagan lives and uh, demonic worship. And so that is, that's what was going on during this time. And if you look at the rest of the verse, it says, we know that we all have knowledge. We all have knowledge. See, Paul and, and some of the mature believers knew better. They actually knew better than to to really be bothered with such food offered, you know, once to idols and then sold in the marketplace. They knew better. They knew the deities or the gods didn't exist and that evil spirits did not contaminate the food. They knew that. But notice the rest of the verse. It says, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. I love that part of the verse. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. You see, knowledge, you know, intermingled with love prevents a believer from exercising freedoms that offend the weaker believer and, you know, and rather builds the others up in truth and in wisdom. You see that? Let's look at verses two and three. It says, and if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, you know, yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Again, love is the proof, everybody. Love is the proof of knowing God, okay? Love is the proof. Look at verse four. Therefore, concerning the the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. You see, he states his agreement, Paul, you know, with with, with the well taught believers there, who knew that idols were nothing, right? So food offered to idols was not defiled, was not defiled. That's pretty much what he's saying right here, okay? Look at verse five. For if, it says, for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, and of course, some were outright fakes and then some were just like manifestations of demons, but none were truly, truly gods, okay? Look at verse six. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we are 
and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. You see that this is a powerful, a clear affirmation right here of the essential equality of God the Father and God the Son. God the Father and God the Son. And then verse 7 says, however, there is not there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol. You see that? And their conscience being weak is defiled. You see something? The consciences of some some individuals or some, I should say, some new converts, people who are just becoming believers, um, were still really accusing them strongly with with regard to allowing them to eat idle food without feeling spiritually corrupted and guilty. You know, they they still imagined that idols were real and that they were evil. You know, the the filed conscience is one that has been violated, okay, bringing fear and shame and guilt and all of those feelings there. Look at verse 8. It says, but food does not commend us to God, right? It does not commend us to God. See, the idea is of really bringing us nearer to God or, or making us approved by him. Food is spiritually neutral, okay? It's spiritually neutral. It's a natural thing, okay? Now, these next couple of verses, I want to say verses 9 through 11, Understand some, when it comes to this stumbling block, creating a stumbling block, some believers would be, would be caused to fall back into old sins by getting involved with foods offered to quote unquote idols. Look at verse 11. It says, and because of your knowledge, okay, because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish. This is a question being asked for whom Christ died. See, Christ died for all who believe, you know, actually bearing the penalty of, you know, for our sin and fully, he fully satisfied the wrath of God. Okay. He made it a complete, perfect sacrifice. Look at verse 12, but when it says, but when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. You sin against Christ. This is a strong warning, a super strong warning. You see that strong warning that causing a brother or sister in Christ to stumble, you know, is more than simply an offense against that person. It's an offense against the Lord himself. Okay. Because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So it is an offense against Christ himself. That's why it says in verse 13, in summary, it says, therefore, okay, as a result of all that we've shared, all that Paul has shared, if food makes my brother stumble, this is something you got to think about. I will never eat meat again. This is what he said, eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. So he's conscious, he's aware. You got to be aware. You got to be sensitive, aware of who is in your surrounding. Okay. Just be conscious of what you're doing when you're, when you're connected with other believers. You, you never know. Uh, what, what level, as far as maturity wise, a believer is, if you know that you're amongst believers who are new, new believers, they're new to Christ, maybe within their first year or so, and maybe know something about them, their background. Okay. But if you use discernment, and I also believe that, that God will give you that discernment to know, uh, this may not be the wisest thing to do. Okay. So just be conscious, be aware, because that's what this particular chapter is all about being sensitive to the conscience of those of believers, new believers, and those, of course, who are mature, those who are mature. Now, I do want to give uh, my fellow panelists, those who are on the Zoom platform with me, an opportunity to share their thoughts uh, about this. So let's see, you can unmute your line for those who are on Zoom if you would have something to share uh, about the verses that we read this morning. All right, Miss Pat, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, as you was reading the scriptures and going over them, what came in my spirit, either you're Christ or Antichrist. Mm. Um, either you're Christ or Antichrist. Uh, point two, we don't need to be a stumbling block 
for those that are new in, in, in Christ. Mm-hmm. We don't need to be a stumbling block. And point three, their blood would be required on our hands if we don't do right by new believers. Right. So that's the points that I want to bring out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have to be conscious. We have to be aware of of those who are in our surrounding. It's very, very important. And I and I believe, as I mentioned, that you know, God, by way of the Holy Spirit, will um, enable us to know, will give us a sense as to you know whether th- it can be offensive to those who are nearby or in our environment. Okay, so Brother Waddell, I see you're here as well. What do you have to share? Man, this is pretty simple and cut and to the point. <laughs> we are supposed to be yes. childlike in our faith, yes, not in our behavior. Come on, come on. Come on, man. It ain't that hard. If you got the liberty that you can eat a split hoof, let's say. We know the stories in scriptures right. where people have taken an instruction for a period of time. <laughs> it was for a period of time. Don't do this or don't cut your hair or don't eat this. Don't. And then it came back and said it's okay. And people still made a religion out of it. It was for a period of time. Mm-hmm. It's in there, and it's broken down that way. I cannot understand for me why that is. But like uh, Sister Pat said, you don't want to be no stumbling block. Why? What's the main reason? Blood on your hands. What happens if you are, have uh, blood on your hands and you're a stumbling block? You can mess around and become a twofold. I don't even know what that means, really. <laughs> <laughs> One fold, two fold, all leading to hell. I'm good. I'm not in that. Mature. Grow up. Mm. Woo! Did y'all get that? He took the mic and just... <laughs> That's all I have to say. Brother Wendell, thank you so very much for your words of wisdom. Powerful. Now, for those of you who are on Facebook and the other platforms, share your thoughts in the comment section, okay? We definitely want to hear from you. We want to say good morning to Taz, good morning to Alicia, and all others who are stopping by and a part of the virtual Bible study And so listen, we are going to continue with our study. You all know that after we go over the New Testament, we focus on understanding concepts pertaining to the kingdom, all right, pertaining to the kingdom. And so that is what we're going to do. We're going to go over that. We're going to go back into our uh, PowerPoint slide. Let's see what we can do here. Whoop. (laughs) All right, let's make sure our screen has adjusted. Let's ensure our screen has adjusted on Facebook. We should be good, and it should has it should have quickly adjusted there. But let's check and make sure. And um, please note that you know understanding the kingdom it, it's going to revolutionize your mindset. It's going to change the way you think about. It's going to help you to gain gain clarity about who you are. You know how you are connected here. You know on Earth, give you a greater sense of purpose. And just really focus on what is most important, okay? Focusing on what is most important, okay? And so what we're going to do right now, again, is delving into those concepts. We're continuing from our our discussion that we had on Friday. I know we didn't have our Bible study, and I thank you so much for everyone's patience. We didn't have it on Saturday because of a, a, it was a change in schedule. And then also, of course, a meeting came up where we had to rise up early and so thank you so much for your understanding with that. Okay. But I know in our last discussion, our last discussion, we were talking about the importance of restoration. Okay. Restoration when it comes to restoring a, a kingdom, because understand something, the, the strategy, the divine strategy, okay, devised and put together by the creator. It follows the same principle of restoration, this general concept of restoration, because the loss of, of heaven's kingdom, okay, on earth through Adam's disobedient act, if you all remember that, you know, and the loss of its earthly, you know, of its earthly envoy, the Holy Spirit. So losing the Holy Spirit, losing the kingdom, right? It demanded restoration. You know, this required a, a heavenly program for earth preservation, so to speak. You know, this program became known as the redemptive work of God. You know, the goal really of the program is to now recover and reestablish the kingdom of heaven on earth, okay, 
and also the reinstatement then of us, of mankind, as, as the earth's kingly representative. Okay, kingly representative. And this strategy was the return of the original Adam. Okay, the original, the return of the original Adam to earth to really reconstruct the old Adam that had failed. Yes, it failed. They it fell. So it means what you know, this means would be the you know, the coming of the Messiah King, right? To redeem, to restore, to reconnect. Three words redeem, restore, reconnect. Man, male and female, okay, back to heaven's government once again. And this promise of this royal seed in Genesis, we can see it, right? If you go back to Genesis chapter three, verse 15, that's where it talks about this promise, you know, to establish the coming of God in the flesh as a legal redeemer, you know, with all the rights to enter, you know, earth's realm to achieve this goal. See, that's why he had to come in the form of man, because he had to be a human. Humans are the agents on the earth. Okay. That's why he created the earth. And when he created the earth, right, in order for there to be a work and for him to help, there had to be a body, a vessel to facilitate that. Okay. Now understand, you know, this declaration was really known as the promise and it really activated the, the expectation of a Messiah King that was destined to really redeem all men, restore us back to our kingly position, okay? The kingly position. See, this process included the calling and the appointment of a, of a specific line, you know, through which this king would come, okay? The king. And that's why I love, you know, the verses, you know, in Genesis chapter 12, where it talks about, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you, right? I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. You see, we have to be careful though about there being a misunderstanding of the message and the method. Because the greatest danger in life is misconstruing of a concept. It's the misconstruing, the, the misunderstanding and application of a concept. So you got to study the promise. It will show you the promise was made to the nations through, at, through Abraham. Okay, you all remember that? The promise was made to the nations through Abraham. The promise was the material, you know, for the introduction of the prophets, right, to the world. And then the, old, the prophets of the Old Testament were, were raised up primarily to continually proclaim this promise. That's what they were doing. They were proclaiming the promise of the coming, Mes you know, the messianic king who is going to actually restore the kingdom that, you know, our father, Adam, lost. Okay, that he lost. You see, Abraham was a son of promise, as promised. He had a, he had a son of promise. Let me say it that way. A Abraham had a son of promise as promised. And you remember him, right? Isaac, you know, and then Isaac, you know, who had, he had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Okay. Jacob and Esau. Jacob was chosen by God to be the line. Okay. For the seed of the Messiah King. And his name was changed by God himself to Israel. Okay, so from what? Jacob to Israel. That his name was changed. And Israel means prince with God. Prince with God. And perhaps this was to confirm, you know, the royal line of descendants. Because Israel had about 12 sons. Remember that? Israel had 12 sons. Okay. And they became known as the 12 tribes, or some people say clans, of Israel. Collectively, all together, they are the Israelites, the Israelites, okay? Now, the Hebrews or the Israelites, you know, they were reminded of the promise from generation to generation. They were continually reminded about it and, and the Messiah King and that the Messiah King will come, you know, and that through him, all the nations of the earth were actually going to be blessed, if we can remember that. Now, they, as the people, they actually misunderstood this promise. And I want to be clear about that. They misunderstood it. 
Okay. They misunderstood the promise, made themselves the object of the promise rather than the conduit. Okay. They made themselves to be the promise rather than the conduit. You see, God, God had promised Abraham that the Messiah would come through his seed to redeem the world. But the Israelites used the choice of their line as a distinguishing factor to separate themselves from the very people they were to serve. You know, they, they developed a self-centered religion. You see that, that it really condemned the world. You know, they were appointed to deliver, you know, the redeemer too, rather than God's, you know, intention of a kingdom of heaven on earth. Israel became the masters of misinformation. If I, if I could put it that way, they became like the masters of mis, misinformation. See, the error was left, the error had left like scars, you know, throughout history. Okay. And it continues to feed the remnant of Judaism today, unfortunately. You know, this is where this whole concept, this whole religion of, of Judaism was born. And it really caused a reactionary development of many other religions of today. And we see that, okay, we can clearly see that today. And unfortunately, um, over the last thousand, couple thousand years, you know, the message of the kingdom was gradually buried uh, in the graveyard of religion, if we were to say it that way. That's how it became buried. I had to go all the way back there to help you to understand how we came to this point of being so religious and the establishment of all these different religions. Now, please understand something, that the Old Testament is Earth's file, you know, of heaven's record. The Old Testament is Earth's file of of, of heaven's record of the promise of the coming of the king and the kingdom. You know, all the prophecies were really about, you know, his arrival and, and what he would bring. The laws, you know, given to Moses kind of, you know, it actually, like, it was like a foreshadowing. You know, it foreshadowed the laws and the principles of the kingdom. And there are many, many references, you know, to this announcement. And a few are actually, we got to, if, if you if we want to take a look at it, you'll see many of them there. Like, for example, if you go to Deuteronomy and you can write these verses down that way, if you want to physically go to them, you can, but Deuteronomy 18, okay. 18 and 15, for example, it says the Lord, your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. Okay. You must listen to him. And you can also see from David's perspective, because he spoke of the kingdom too. If you look at, for example, uh, Psalms 145 and 13, Psalms 145 and 13, where it says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. You see that? It's an everlasting kingdom. Now, Isaiah, he actually saw the coming of the king and the kingdom in detail. Okay, he saw it in detail. He said it, look, if you go to Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, where it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Okay, and the government, why would he say government? See, think about it. It's, you put one on one together, you're like, man, this is so clear. The government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Hmm. Now, we all know Daniel went in, right? He went in. When it comes to describing the kingdom, I, okay, I just want you to go read the entire chapter of Daniel chapter 7, and you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. I need you to read that whole chapter one day. Chapter 7 of Daniel, okay? Read that entire chapter. 
See, it's incredible to read, you know, some of these verses and see without a doubt that the message of the Bible is about the coming of a kingdom, not a religion. It's never been about a religion. See, the announcement of the Old Testament was about the coming of a prophet who would prepare the way and introduce the Messiah King to the world personally, personally. You see, this was referring to John the Baptist. See, we can read it. We can read it. It's clear. The prophecy from Malachi. And you can see it, Malachi chapter four, verses four through six, because it says, remember the law of my servant Moses, the degrees and laws I gave him uh, at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. You see that? So we see that the restoration plan of God was, was in motion. And from it's even from that announcement to the, you know, the, the adversary in in Genesis, see the prophecy stated that he will come Christ, right? He will come and prepare the people. No, actually I'll say it this way that, you know, that God will come. He will prepare the people for the entrance of the king and the kingdom. Okay, the king and the kingdom. That's what it's always been about. That's what it's always been about. You see, God is a great communicator. Can I just, can I just, can I say that? God is a great communicator. He knew, he knew that he could not fully reveal the good news of his kingdom until the right environment. Now, why do I say that? Why do I say that? Okay. Because look, (laughs) the promise of the coming Messiah King, you know, it, God waited 4,000 years before he sent his Messiah King to the earth. 4,000 years. Okay. He had to wait until an environment existed in which people could understand the message. Are you, are you getting that? See, it's only when the time was right, you know, that Christ could come. Jesus, Jesus could not come until a kingdom model existed, a kingdom model. Okay. As a visual illustration that really helped people help us understand his teachings on the kingdom. See, only in the fullness of time, you see that? In the fullness of time, and that's what the Bible says, the fullness of time, could the kingdom be revealed? See, if you go back to that same chapter of Genesis, where it really describes the fall of man, see, it also announces God's promised solution, okay? God's promised solution. See, because of the serpents or Satan's role, you know, in tempting the first human couple to sin, God promised a curse on him which also foretold his future doom. Remember, you can go back to Genesis chapter three, verses 14 and 15. All right. He promised a doom. God promised that one of Eve's offspring or seed, right? will crush the serpent's head, inflicting a fatal wound. And now that seed would be Jesus Christ, guys. The seed was Jesus, you know? He was the culmination of thousands of years of preparation, you know, in God's plan. So what was God waiting for? I guess that's the big question that some people would ask. You know, what was God waiting for? Right? He needed an environment. He was setting the stage. He was preparing an environment for his son's appearance. See, let me make sure I check with time. I don't want to go overboard. Okay. Okay. Adam and Eve, we got to, it's always important to reflect back at the beginning. Adam and Eve sinned and how, and what did they do? They sinned by disobeying God and, and, and by this action, they cut themselves off, you know, from King, from his kingdom. The, the, The first, the first significant figure after Adam and Eve was Noah. Remember Noah. He was a righteous man. He, you know, who he believed in and he followed God. Okay. And he and his family, they survived the great flood. Remember that by really, by riding it out in the ark. 
And then afterwards, Noah planted a vineyard. And unfortunately, he got drunk, right? He got he had a vineyard and, and he got drunk. But eventually his sons went their own way and they actually forgot about God. Okay? Their descendants, as a result, they actually fell into idol worship and, and other kinds of evil things. You know, and from that time, you know, it wasn't quite right. Time wasn't quite right, quite right for the kingdom at that point. Now, even after Noah, I think it was about 10 generations afterwards, you know, God spoke to eight to, to, to Abram, Abram, you know, a descendant of, of, of Noah's son, Shem. Okay. And God revealed himself to Abraham and, and made a, uh, a covenant with him that would actually make him a great nation. Now from Abraham came Isaac, you know, the son born to him in his old age, you know, and still at that point, God had no model of the kingdom at that point. Okay. Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. God appeared to Jacob, right? And said, look, I'm going to make you, I'm going to make, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm a name. See, your name will now be called Israel. Change his name and everything, guys. Israel had 12 sons. You know, they were fathers of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And God was working towards his model even still, okay? Through Moses, he delivered the Israelites, okay, from slavery in Egypt. He brought them into the de desert, right? Told them, you're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. And I will, look, I'm going to lead you into a land I promised your forefathers. In other words, you know, he's saying, look, I'm going to be your king and you're going to be my kingdom. He's telling them, I, look, I'm going to be your king. I'm going to be your king and you're going to be my kingdom. See, but after a while, see, the people of Israel got tired of God, of a God they could not see. See, that's the problem. They lacked faith. They were tired of a God they couldn't see and they longed for a king that they could see. See, this is the problem. God never desired. And I know we talked about this before. God never desired for them to have an earthly king. No. Uh -uh. See, this was not, this was not the appropriate model that he was seeking, but nevertheless, you know, God gave into their wishes and instructed the prophet Samuel, remember that, to anoint Saul. Samuel anointed Saul as king of Israel. Now, because of the nation, because the nation of Israel rejected God, you know, in favor of an earthly king, the time was still not right for the kingdom of heaven to be revealed. Saul ended up disobeying God to the point at which God rejected him as a king. You know, totally. God then chose David, you know, a man after his own heart, to be king in Saul's place, okay? And David was a good king. He was a mighty warrior. He loved God. You know, he was a poet. He was a worshiper. We, we see a lot of the Psalms, right? That's where the bulk of the book was, you know, that book was written by David. Now, David was the first to really inf to combine like the functions of priest and king. He was the first one. You know, he worshiped and he wrote worship songs, right? He administered government wisely and ably, you know. A model of God's kingdom was beginning to emerge at this point. It was beginning to emerge. David, but see, here's a problem. David is human. He was human, <laughs> okay? He disappointed God. What did he do, guys? Remember that story. He disappointed God by committing adultery with Bathsheba. Remember? Com he compounded his sin. He tried to cover it up. It was, ooh, it was a mess. <laughs> he arranged to have her husband, Uriah, killed. And then from that point until the end of his life, he was troubled. He said, troubled, man, it, it really, really heaped upon David's steps. You know, and after the death of Solomon, David's wise, his capable son and successor, you know, the, the death of Solomon, see, this, the kingdom they had built actually split. You know, it split in two as 10 tribes rebelled against the house of David, unfortunately. And so as a result, we know at that point that the time was still not right for the kingdom of heaven to be revealed. So you see, through all of this time, God was waiting for the perfect time. He really was. And if we were to continue to talk about the Assyrian Empire, you know, and then, of course, the kingdom of Judah, Judah was conquered by the Babylonians. And then, you know, you have this whole exile period. 
man, the people were carried into exile for about 70 years, 70 years. And then Daniel, you know, one of the exiles, an official, you know, in the Babylonian government, he received a vision from God, you know, that really showed him, you know, that the kingdom was not dead and forgotten. You know, God was still working towards his model. He was preparing for the fullness of time, you know, when his son would actually come and reveal the kingdom. And Daniel actually spoke of a son, a son of man who would do great things. And several hundred years later, Jesus would refer to himself as the son of man, you know, his favorite self-designation. Okay. Now we can go on and on and on and talk about this because, you know, it goes into talking about, you know, understand, we have to understand then the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Romans. Okay. Rome became the great emperor in history because it had a system of government that worked better than any that had gone before it. It was a simple system. Like it was, okay, take over territory, right? Leave the people in the land, appoint a governor, okay? Establish an administration that will turn them into Romans. You see what was going on? A system was put in place. Everything was set now. You know, the Roman empire provided like perfect, a perfect model for the message of the kingdom of God. The reason being is because it contained the concepts of the kingdom that will make the message of Jesus a bit easier to truly understand. It's all about preparing the mind of the people. You see, God's kingdom model was, was in place. The time had come, you know, for God to send his son. The time, the time had come for the kingdom of heaven to be revealed. And the Bible says that when the fullness of time came, God sent his son, Jesus Christ into the world. You know what that means? That means that God waited to send Jesus until the situation was ripe. Jesus came as, you know, at just the right moment in place in history. Now, what made this time like 2000 years ago, you know, 2000 years ago, right? What made the time right? Now, amongst other things, the time was right because, you know, there was a great earthly kingdom in place that could provide tangible, visible, like illustrations of Jesus's teachings about the kingdom. And the Roman Empire served as a model, you know, until under Caesar, the Roman Empire was a kingdom. It it was not a democracy. Okay. It was not a democracy, right? Caesar was a king, not a president. I know I'm touching on some toes right now. See, During Jesus's day, Rome ruled most of the world. Its governments, its laws, its its institutions, its culture was everywhere. Every word that Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God had a physical equivalent in Rome. It made the message easier to understand for the people who listened to him. For example, for example, let me give you an example. The Roman Senate was called the Ecclesia. The ecclesia, a great, this is a Greek word that actually means assembly or called out ones. Now, Greek and Latin were both widely, widely spoken during this time, during the Roman empire, you know, and Jesus actually spoke, I I, I I can't even say this word every time, every time I try to say it, I mess it up. (laughs) It was a common language of the Jews of Palestine. But the Gospels were originally, you know, it was actually written in Greek. You know, the Gospel writers use the word Ecclesia, you know, in passages where Jesus talks about building his church. And and, and just as Caesar had an assembly of called out ones, he had the Senate. So also did Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Okay. He had an assembly of called out ones. That's the church. The church. Okay. The church. I'm going to stop right here. Cause I know I, 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 I probably, I know with all the history talk, I had to help you understand why the time was right. You know, why, whew, why certain times were not the right times. You had, I had to go back to bring you to where we are today. Okay. 
But we're going to go into talking about this whole image, this whole idea about a king. We're going to talk about that and, um, and how it really, you know, came to make sense, you know, especially with the introduction of Jesus, you know, and Jesus arriving on, on the scene <laughs> in the earth. Okay. And so I'm a pause. You guys know that I, I, I want to share some more, but I, you know, the hour has almost approached and I also want to give those who are on the panel an opportunity to share um, some information. So listen, uh, brother Wendell, um, do you have something that you want to share before we prepare to close it out and summarize things up? I'm thinking along the lines as you're speaking mm -hmm. where Jesus came and for three days he was dead. Mm. When you said that religion has buried, or in so many words, um, kingdom, uh -huh. what we're supposed to be doing, not what we made up, this religion foolishness that's buried the kingdom, as you said, mm -hmm. what well, we were made in his image and his likeness, I highly suggest we make today, if we have not already, our third day and resurrect that kingdom. Cool. I'm done. I'm finished. What? How you? Okay. Okay. Wow. Did you guys get that? I'm hoping. I'm hoping that you understood what Brother Wendell just said. The time is now. The time is now. I mean, of course, more people are becoming enlightened. You should be becoming enlightened. Not just, and I know there are many teachers who speak about it, right? And I'm just a, I'm a, just a student of the teachers as well who spoke about it, but just becoming even more enlightened about this concept of the kingdom. The time is now for more and more people to have their, their eyes open to the truth, to learn more about the kingdom of God. The time is now, especially in the season in which we're in right now with all that's going on around the world. People need to understand. They need to know that there is still a government that's still supreme, even above the governments of this earth. And that is the kingdom of God. Okay, the kingdom of God. And I, and I believe this is the reason why he's placing this on the hearts of many. I know it's not just myself. I know there are many others who are still speaking of it. And I feel like, I feel like, you know, a part of what it is that I'm called to do is continue this torch, you know, from the late, uh, the late teachers who have passed on, some of the greats like Dr. Miles Monroe and many others out there who spoke on this concept. It's time for us to rise up and to take our place as kingdom ambassadors that God has originally wanted us to be. Kingdom ambassadors, not just uh, pew holders. This is the reason I just honestly believe that with all that's going on, right? You know, many of us not being in church buildings, okay? Because the church is not, it's a building, it's an organization, but it's not necessarily a physical building as you would think it be, okay? It's us. We are the buildings. We are the temple. God comes in and dwells in us. In us, he comes in to dwell, okay? When we place too much emphasis on the wrong things, sometimes God enables things to happen to reshift our focus. And I honestly believe that this situation that the world is in, and even, of course, that the church has experienced as well, has caused everyone to shift and get back into focus. That's what God is wanting. He wants people to get back in focus, get back in alignment. There's too much going on. And notice how it impacted the entire world. It caused this whole shutdown of the entire world. And God also knew this. If he can touch the pockets of the people, I'm going to stop right there. If he can touch the pockets of the people, he will get your attention. He wants your attention. He's trying to get your attention. The question is, does he have it? Does he have your attention? 
So what we've gone over, everyone, what we've gone over so far, you know, we've gone over spoken about speaking about the consciousness of the people, being sensitive to the consciousness of people around you in your environment, focusing in on first Corinthians chapter eight. Right. And then we delved into just going over the background for how God was really preparing a, a preparing the environment, you know, to really int- introduce the kingdom, right. To introduce, um, rest to be, to restore the people of earth back to him. This whole ministry, the Bible speaks about it as being a ministry of reconciliation. And that's exactly what it is. He had a plan in mind throughout history to restore mankind back to himself. And you are a part of that plan. You are a part of it. He wants to be restored with you. He wants to have a relationship with you, not a religion. People create religions. People, when people try to do things their own way and not consult the creator, you end up creating something that's false, that's an imitation. And so we have to get back. And the kingdom of God is here. It is now. It's upon you. And it wants to, of course, you definitely have a, a, a sense of the kingdom of God dwelling in you for those of you who desire to have a relationship with the father got to have that desire to have a relationship okay and so what we're going to do right now is we're going to what pray we're going to pray okay and i'm hoping in in my, my desire for foremost is that you've enjoyed what you've what you've received on today you know, if anything's touched your heart, your mind, go ahead, share your, share that information in the comment section. You never know who it would be a blessing for. Okay. You never know who it will be a blessing for. So we're going to take a moment. We're going to pray. We're going to be dismissed. We're going to be on our way. Okay. On our way. And so listen, let's go ahead and pray guys. Thank you, Lord, for this day, for this opportunity, this moment, this time of coming together, leveraging social media, the internet, to come together to learn more about you, to learn more about your plan, about learn more about, about what it is that we are here to do foremost. We thank you for, for just giving us the opportunity to understand more about the kingdom and helping us to understand about timing, about your whole whole concept of timing and your perfect plan that you've put together for us so we can have a relationship with you, a right relationship with you. And so, Father, I do pray that you would touch us as we go our different ways. Father, that you would be with us, that you would never leave us nor forsake us. And if there be some, if there be one, who desires to have a relationship with you. Lord, we just pray you would touch their hearts and their minds right now. Father, you said in your word that if we believe with our heart that Jesus is Lord, and that if we believe that you, Father, have raised Jesus from the grave, that we, that they, that we can be saved. And so believe and confess. Believe and confess. And as you believe and as you confess, entrance of the kingdom, we thank you, Father, for that. And so, Father, we just pray you would you would have your way in us and through us. We just pray that you would help us to take this word, digest the word, share this word with others so that they will be encouraged. And so, Father, we thank you for this time. We just pray that your will continue to be done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So listen, I just want to say thank you so very much, everybody, uh, for being here with, with not just me, but with everyone on today. It's been an honor. It truly has been a privilege, uh, to join with you on this morning. And so we'll be back. Okay. We'll be back tomorrow morning, Lord willing, Lord willing, we'll be back tomorrow morning, um, 8 30 AM Eastern standard time, 
Uh, we'll be right here on the platform. Again, join us. Uh, beat, a, beat us here. <laughs> be ready in prep mode as we continue our discussion about the kingdom of God and as we move into 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So again, thank you so much, everyone. God bless. And remember, I love each and every one of you. And God loves you all the more. Be blessed, everybody.